Well, it's my privilege to be back in the pulpit again, and this is the fourth time and the last time for maybe some time to come. Who knows? And uh, so it's great to be here and to conclude our series, which we have started on this topic of Occupy Till I Come. And it's all a bit about the economies of the Bible, basically, and especially about the economy that was in, during the book of Acts and that which was freshly began uh, post Acts 28, after the great boundary of the book of Acts. So this is really no simple study. It's not something that for someone perhaps who is not a Christian, it's really for someone who has come to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and now this is the next step. It's the next step on the way. And uh, we need to refresh our memories of some of the great truths that we have looked at last time so that we can connect ideas. I'm going to be a little bit quicker than normal uh, because I've been known to run rabbit trails at this particular point in time. So I'm going to be very careful to stick to the slides. And we looked at this passage which was found in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We'll now bow our heads in prayer that we can understand further concerning the scriptures. Our God and Father, we thank thee this time that we can meet together freely in this country at this time. There is certainly freedom. We pray, Lord, that we would stand up for these freedoms and that we would use them for the benefit of the gospel that we'd allow others to know the grace of God that has appeared in our lives and then to take them on to perfection. So now as we open the scriptures, we ask for your understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So it says here, upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so up here I like to draw this picture because it helps to sort of get a road map of, of what's going on. So if this here is the book of Acts, so in, in the Bible there is a book. It's called the book of Acts, written by Luke. And this book gives you basically the skeletal structure, if you like, of what went on after that Christ ascended up into heaven's glory and that the apostles went out in the strength and power of the Spirit of God ministering the gospel to the Jew first. And in fact, right at the very beginning, it wasn't just Jew first, it was Jew only. And it was only after you find Peter being brought to the fore and being told to go to Cornelius and the conversion of Paul that things really started going in relationship to the Gentiles. So in the Bible, of course, there are these two groups, the Gentiles and the Jews. So it's kind of easy to find New Zealanders. Uh, it's kind of easy to find Persians. It's kind of easy to find Samoans and Nuaeans and Tongans and Raratongans. They're easy to find because they're non-Jews. So in the Bible you find that there are these two groups. You might say, well, why are there these two groups? Well, because God, for his own purpose, set aside a nation, the nation of Israel, to be a kingdom of priests. That's what was their destiny, to be a nation that was wholly separated to take the message of God to the nations. The only problem is they said, no, we don't want to do that job. We, don't, we, we won't accept that job. And so God still deals with them. He doesn't give up on them. He keeps after them to get busy with his work. And so what you find is in the book of Acts is that there is this interaction between the, the Gentiles and the Jews where the Jew is first because God is still dealing with them and he uses the Gentiles to, to provoke them to jealousy. So that's basically what's going on. And during this time in the book of Acts there are various epistles or letters. An epistle is just a letter. There are various letters written specifically by the Apostle Paul. And those epistles, like Romans, like 1 Corinthians, like 2 Corinthians, they conform, of course, to the doctrine and teaching during this age. 
Now you'll notice something about this. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Upon whom, look at the Greek text, says, unto whom the ends, that's plural, of the ages have arrived. The ends of the ages have arrived. The ends, the goals of the ages have arrived. So what you find in the book of Acts is not the beginning of a new age, but the gathering together of the prophecy of the ages, that is the pull, pulling together of the ends, the goals of the ages. So this is really about how this particular age comes to an end. And that's giving us a lot of instruction about the nature of the book of Acts. And further to this is the book of Hebrews, written by Paul, I believe, although it's hard to prove exactly that's the case. But Hebrews 9.26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Notice that there is a key word coming up here, foundation, katabole, the overthrow of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Oh, well look at this. But now once upon the ends of the ages... This suntalaya here, in other contexts I've shown you, have the meaning of the gathering together, like the end of the harvest, the harvest time. You know, you've got a harvest, you plant the seed, the, sun, the seed grows, it turns into various forms, and then finally, at the end, there's a harvest. Well, what's this time then? Well, it's the time of the harvest. That's the nature of this time, the harvest time. It's the gathering together. It's the end of the age. It's not the beginning. Of, a lot of people want to say that the book of Acts is the beginning of our age. And what they try to do is they try and start our age in Acts chapter 9. Or they'll try and start it in Acts chapter 13. Or they'll try and start it in Acts chapter 17. They'll try and start the new age somewhere here. But the scriptures say this is the Suntalaya. This is the ends of the ages. This is all this fulfillment taking place. It's a miraculous time. It's a time of great distress, of great necessity. And you'll find this, and I went through some of these passages, and you'll notice that that Matthew 13 passage brought up the business about the catabole, the foundation of the world, and these break into two. You've got before the foundation of the world on the right and then from the foundation on the left. From the foundation you'll find Israel's prophecy, all the things, all the things that relate to Israel. And then especially here in Ephesians 1.4 you find before the foundation of the world relating to ours. So this is the Acts age. The, uh, these ages uh, come to their fru fruition in the book of Acts. And then I've got this black arrow concerning before the foundation of the world, information given for this age. Very important. And I pointed out some notes that you can find on rightdivision.com and the study of the mystery. And I showed you in Romans 16.25 that the mystery mentioned there it relates to a mystery which had been hid in the ages and was made manifest and through the scriptures of the prophets was made known. So it's a very important thing to see, and I went through this diagram with you, this prophetical scripture. And what is the, the gospel of, of Romans right there in Romans 16? It relates to the gospel that we are all related to Adam. There's no mention of Abraham. There's no mention of these things uh, concerning Israel. Rather, Paul in Romans takes you right back to Adam, and therefore we all can find the gospel as it relates to us because we are all sons of Adam. And that's, that's what it's all about today. Wasn't that quick? Now, that's, that's what you call a review, man. We're right in today. All right, so what I'm going to do is we're going to look at the, the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, I have done a lot of... Uh, talks about 1 Corinthians and they are, I think we're up to around about part 34 
uh, on rightdivision.com. And you can go to rightdivision.com and there there's slides, there's teacher notes, and there's, there's everything. You can get everything there. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pick out just some of the things that here, although I could go to Galatians, I could go to Romans, I'm trying to show you the nature of the book of Acts, what's going on during the book of Acts, what's going on in this age, and try and show you that it makes a lot of sense to keep these things separate and not to try and confuse them, not trying to mesh them together. That's part of what I want to show you, but there's some other things as well. So 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1, look what it says. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. Oh, that's interesting. That means the Corinthians wrote letters to Paul. Or at least one. The things whereof ye wrote unto me. So the Corinthians had some problems. And Paul is now going to address these problems. And he says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And this particular chapter gets into the nitty gritty of the relationship between man and woman, but in a particular context. So the context here is very, very important. Because Paul is going to bring out some teaching which is appropriate to the context. And if you try and take it out of this context, then you'll get some serious problems. Major, major problems. And I'll hopefully bring this out to, uh, for you to see. Now, as you go down, you can read all about this interesting stuff to do with the relationship between man and woman and whether it would be a good thing to get married, whether it's a good thing for the young men and young women to marry, etc., etc. Now, down in verse 35, it says this. So go to chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, verse 35. And this I speak for your own profit. Okay? He's speaking this for their own profit. Not that I might or may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, that's honorable, and that you may attend unto the Lord without distraction. So his emphasis is attending unto the Lord without distraction. And what he does in here, and you can read the context, is that he gives permission for people if they have the necessity to get married to do so. So he's not saying that it is a sinful thing during the book of Acts for people to marry, but that what he wants is no snare to be put upon people. But the point that comes out very, very clearly in here is what is better. What is the best state to exist between man and and woman. Now, we'll see this and we'll really get into this issue, but I want you to look at verse uh, 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. So here comes general inspiration. There was no command. You remember Paul, he would get inspiration and he would get the various revelations of all kinds of doctrine given directly to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there are other times when he would write under general inspiration. Here's one case here. He says in verse 26, I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. The present distress. I say that it's good for a man so to be. Hmm. Art thou bound on a wife? Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Why? Because Paul is giving doctrine and teaching that will enable them to function properly in this particular age. Now notice this present distress or present necessity. And he says, but this I say, brethren, that the time is short. Notice verse 26 and 29. Okay? These are extremely critical passages 
and understanding what's going on during this time. This is no baby course that I'm giving you now, right? This is not for little baby children who, you know, are easily going to adapt to the understanding of the doctrine of this scriptures I'm giving. This is a university style study, isn't it? We're talking about getting on with the business of understanding important doctrine from the Bible. And we should be concerned with this. We, we should be concerned with growing, going on unto perfection. He says in verse 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though, look at this, they had none. Be as though they had none. Whoa, what, what kind of doctrine is this? Be as though that you did not have a wife. Why? Because this is the time. There were current necessities that came on this time. Why? This is the ends of the ages, right? This is the ends of the game. This is the suntalaya. This is the gathering in. This is the harvest time, man. Christ is ready to return and set up his kingdom. I gave you lots of passages about that. Now you'll notice that in this passage in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 35, he says, and, I, and this I speak for your own profit, not that I may, may cast a snare, a snare upon you, a snare. Paul is not about ensnaring people. And a snare is simply a kind of a, a, a noose with a, a, a slip knot on it, just as a lasso is. So I've entitled this the Mid-Axe Cowboys. Mid-Axe Cowboys. We're, we were taken by some friends to Dallas, Texas. And you, there you can get the authentic cowboy gear. You know, you can go into these shops and you can get authentic cowboy hats and cowboy boots and the whole shebang. Well, we couldn't afford all of it, but we did get some hats. <laughs> I was, I was tempted to bring one, but I thought, oh, no, I don't want to bust it up. But anyway, so Mid-Axe Cowboys. Why would I call it Mid-Axe Cowboys? Because here's the thought. This is the thought. If you take the message that's in here concerning marriage, concerning the idea of the relationship between man and woman, and rip it out of its context, what Paul says here that he does not want to ensnare people, but rather to give them the position of being able to serve the Lord without distraction, and that without distraction is an adverb, which means it modifies the verb. It means that in the way that you carry out your business as a minister during this time is to be without distraction. And... He, he gives this doctrine in order that you're not ensnared. But if you rip it out of its context, what happens is you end up with doctrine that will severely entrap people. We've seen some examples of this already, haven't we? For example, the doctrine of head coverings. We've seen this. We've seen this, for example, in the imposition of traditions. All to be found in 1 Corinthians. All of them. Why? Because that's part of this Acts period. This is part of what's going on. You know, when I first got saved, I had some serious doubts about the Bible because I, I read some of these things. I thought, oh, what's going on here? Am I supposed to get married or not? You know? It's a good question, isn't it? Young men here. There's some young men here. Do you think you should get married or not? Well, let's have a look at some, some verses. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 7.37 says this, Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so de decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. That is, you know, here's the man, the father, he has that right to give the, the daughter off in marriage. Okay, and it says, he says, doeth well. Okay, that's okay. Now look what it says in red. I've sort of put it in red just so you can read it. But he that giveth her not in marriage 
do it better. Do it better. So it's very clear that there are certain better things in the book of Acts. And one of the better states, as far as Paul is concerned, is not to be married. Not to be married. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So if you're serious about serving God, and let's pretend I was a mid axe cowboy, right? Then what I could do is I could get out my lasso, and I could throw that lasso around you and pull it in, man, and I can say, you want to serve God, it's better that you don't get married. Then I'll have all these young men in there. They're not getting married. And they're going to do exactly what I tell them to do because I'm the man, right? I'm the man. And I've got the word and they will respect me because I'm giving the word. And they will do what I say they should do. And so what do we get? What do we get in Christianity today? We get these little kingdoms appearing in various fellowships all around the world. Where people are saying, oh, he's got the word and we're going to give all our money to this ministry and we're going to do this. We're going to fulfill this thing because he's the man and we're not going to get married and we're going to tithe and we're going to do all these things. You see the point I'm making here? Now it says, you know, <clears throat> in all sorts of passages, but he that giveth not in marriage doeth better. You notice this little here negates it. But he that does not give in marriage doeth better. Doeth better. And we can go through a lot of passages to, to back this up and you can write these down and check them out for yourself. But I want to move on because I've got a lot to give you and so I want to sort of uh, just move on, point out a few things and move on. Um, so without Acts 28, right division, error is easily promoted. That's my thesis, if you like. If you do not rightly divide the word of truth, you don't understand that right at the end of the book of Acts, some new doctrine was given to Paul the prisoner. And you notice the way I've written this. And by the way, on rightdivision.com, I've got a, a blog there which, which is entitled... Uh, I think I've entitled it Paul or Paul. I've written it like that. And the reason why I write it like that is because AU on the periodic table of elements is Aurum. And it stands for gold, man. Gold. And it represents Paul's second ministry after Acts 28. In 1 Timothy 5.14, this is after Acts 28, Paul says this, I will therefore that the younger women marry, I will. This is Paul's will, which he's writing under inspiration, and therefore it's God's will. Bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary speak, to speak re reproachfully. So, what's this? This is the exact opposite of what you find in the book of Acts. The opposite. You say, it doesn't matter about right division, that's just your opinion, it's just a load of ideas and theory and it's got no practical consequence. Is this practical or not? This gets down to something pretty important. Hey, young people, marriage is one of the big decisions in your life. Big. Massive. And if you don't get the right person and you marry the wrong person, then there can be hell to pay, man. <laughs> right? Those that are married are saying, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And any squir you know, squirmishes and um, skirmishes that we might have between each other as married couples, that's nothing compared to what you get when people are opposing each other in a, in a married situation. Man, you talk about World War III. That's one of the important decisions. Of course, coming to the Lord's Savior and asking Him to save you is the big, biggest decision you can make. And 
After that, of course, you want to go on to perfection, but you want to do so with a person who is with you. With you, not against you. It's an important thing, very important doctrine. Well, here, what have we got here? Well, over here, it's better that you don't get married, and over here, reversal. What's going on? What's going on, my friends, is the fact that a new age began. Christ's coming is not near at hand anymore. It was during the book of hand, book of Acts. The last days were there, man. So what do we got to watch out for? We got to watch out for the mid-act cowboys. We got to watch out for being ensnared. And how can we fight against that being ensnared with false doctrine is to show the correct division in the scripture and understand what's given to us. Look at this. This is 1 Timothy 4, 3. This is after the end of the book of Acts. It says this, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. With truth comes liberty. But what we have here, we have doctrines of devils coming in. Forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry. Oh, well, you know, Paul did not forbid to marry. He's told us what was the better state, but he never for forbade to marry during the book of Acts. But surely you can see that with a little bit of a twist, with just a little bit of addition to this doctrine, false doctrine, even doctrines of devils could easily be generated by a mid-axe cowboy. Right? It's true. It could happen. So, I want to look at this topic of believing. You are, hopefully, people here have come to that position in your life where you've heard the gospel. You have believed. Let's have a look at this passage. It's in the book of Ephesians. Follow it with me. Ephesians chapter number 1. This book of Ephesians is a magnificent book, man. It's a, a book that was given to Paul post Act 28 when Paul was a prisoner. It says this in Ephesians chapter number 1, uh, in verse uh, 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted. Wait a minute. In whom? That's in Christ. In whom, in Christ, you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. So you hear the word of truth. It comes to you and you trust in Christ. In whom also after that ye believed, oh, I believe. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And what is that? which is the earnest, the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This praise of his glory forms a nice structure here. But notice it says unto the redemption of the purchased possession. That's the resurrection, man. That's the resurrection. So what's going on here? You have the gospel of your salvation. Look at verse 13. The gospel of your salvation. That's where life begins for you. Now, life being promised in God is the same things as certainty. It's given to you, even with this down payment. So, you're, you know that you're going to come up in the resurrection. So, there is a gospel. So, over here, Paul talks about the gospel... Of your salvation. Okay? It's there. Have you trusted Christ? Okay? Then here is the gospel of your salvation. I believe. Yes, I believe. And the moment you believe, something wonderful happens. This gospel is revealed in Romans 16 and Romans chapter 8. It's given to you through Romans concerning justification by faith. We know about the salvation. It's been hid in the scriptures and it's been made manifest by the Apostle Paul during the book of Acts and 
It's been explained. It's been brought out through prophetical scriptures. We can find it. We can find and, and talk about this gospel that relates to your salvation. Here's 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. We've been going through the uh, New Testament books in relationship to the book of Acts. And we've said, yes, while it's certainly true that there are different economies, there are many things that differ and there are some things that remain the same. And one, one of the things that remains the same is justification by faith. Salvation is one of those foundational issues. Now look at 1 Corinthians 15, and this is right near the end of the book of 1 Corinthians. It says this in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, you got that? Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Oh, I declared, gospel, preached, received, Stand. Okay, so they were standing in this. This is something they would affirm and understand. By which also ye are saved. Ye are saved. Man, what do you mean saved? Well, saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the fact that we, as in Adam, all die. But... Likewise, ye that are in Christ shall be made alive. That's through the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So when you come in contact and you trust in Jesus Christ, then you've got life to come. Hey, this is salvation, man. This is something we all want to know about. Or you kids better know about it. And it says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. Okay, look at this. A lot of people want to get very legalistic about their salvation. And what they trust on is a date. On the 20th of September, 1993, at 2 p.m., I trusted in Christ. Yeah, and what's in your brain right now? What's in you? What are you trusting on now? Well, um, uh, water baptism. Uh, I partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, how do you know you're saved? Well, I'm a follow the Ten Commandments guy. What that means, my friends, is that you're lost. You're lost. And you need to be saved. You see the point I'm making? That's why Paul says, if you keep in memory. Right? It's not something that you put down in your little scrapbook and you put a little tick mark or you put a little nick in your belt. All right? It's not what it's about. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, here, here it comes, according to the scriptures. Oh, didn't we read about that in Romans 16? Wasn't it through the scriptures that he would make this known? Yes, it was made manifest. He got special revelation. He got special understanding about this justification by faith. But nonetheless, it was hid in the scriptures. And being a divine and inspired apostle, he could bring it out of the scriptures. Right? He could do it. And that's what he's doing here. So it's pretty important to see it. It says in verse 4, And that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. Now, what I want to point out here is that where it says in verse 1, the gospel which I preached unto you, the gospel which I preached unto you, you could, just to be very awkward, but nonetheless bring out the idea, you could say, this means the gospel which I gospelized. The gospel being the message, and he then gospelized it. He brought it out. He brought it out. That's the verb of bringing this message of the good news out. He gospelized. He verbalized this. He went through this. Okay. And the gospel is no mere trifle, of course. It's the power of God unto salvation, and it's important to understand. Now notice in verse 13, uh, verse 3, I should say, of 
chapter 15. It says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Ketatas grapheth. That is according to the Old Testament Scriptures. Paul was ministering none other things than what Moses and the prophets said should come and that included the gospel. You say, prove it. Hold your place there, man. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1. You've already got a plane, as already said, which according to the scriptures, but look at this, Romans 1, 1, Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. Which he had promised afore. Promised, man. None other things than those which Moses and the prophets said should come, and that was Paul's first ministry. His first ministry, which relates to what happened in the book of Acts, relates to the scriptures of the Old Testament. The ends of the ages have come. The sun to light. All these things come together. And they are important. And as it says in verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, do you notice that in all this, in all this to do with the gospel that by which you're saved, it has nothing to do with the mystery. It has nothing to do with the secret which had been hid in God and kept away from the prophets. This mystery here you read about in Ephesians 3 and in Colossians 1 which relates to something the prophets knew nothing about and you can search in vain in the Old Testament to find it. Do it. I challenge you to go through and see if you can find it. It's not there. It was hid in God. The gospel by which you are saved, at least talking to the, the Corinthians and later on Ephesians 1.13, it relates to the scriptures. We can find it in the scriptures. So, so what? What has that got to do with us? My friends, there are plenty of gospels in the Bible. There are plenty of news that you can find about in the Bible. I want you to find this passage. It's in the book of Ephesians. And it's chapter number 3. So what are we doing now? We are jumping the great divide, man. We're crossing the Jordan into the new land. But unlike the Jordan and the land that's a part of the Old Testament scriptures and to do with Israel, this land is never, was never prophesied to be a hope for anybody until the book of Ephesians is written. And it says this in Ephesians 3... It says this, um, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Oh, now what we need to be careful about is what is the gospel here? This is three chapters over from the beginning. So what is the gospel here? Gospel just means good news. So, okay, so we should ask, what is the good news he's talking about? Well, keep on reading. It says, whereof I was made a minister. Whereof I was made a minister. So this part where it says whereof, it relates to the gospel. Of which? The gospel. By the gospel. Of which? I was made a minister. Or oh, what was he made a minister? Of this particular gospel. And notice how backing up that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, same body, partakers of his promise through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should, here comes the words, preach. Remember we looked at this in 1 Corinthians 15? The gospel, which was gospelized. Okay, we've got mention here of a gospel, and now it's being gospelized among the Gentiles. The unsearchable riches of Christ. 
Well, then this is not the gospel of your salvation. This is not the thing that was written in the Old Testament. This is something that was hid. It's only made known here. You say, what's the importance of this gospel? Well, the importance of this gospel is this. Look what it says in verse 6. And if you don't think, you'll miss this. So it's time to think. You say, I didn't come to church to think. I came to church to just have a bit of a sing-along. Come on. Come on. It's time to use the brain. You know, I know the brain, two-thirds of it you don't use because of the fall. But one-third of it there you've got access to. And I know you can do all sorts of other things. So let's engage that one-third of the brain. Here it goes. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How, Paul? How? How do you get this? Fellow heirs, same body, partakers of his promise. How? By the gospel. But what gospel? How do you get to be joint heirs, joint partakers of the joint body? How is it you get all this? It's by the gospel. And this gospel is the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. You get that? That's how you get it. Well, then I've got something I need to put to you. If you want a part of this, then you have to believe another gospel. Different gospel. You've, I'm talking to most of you here, I'm not going to pretend all of you, because I won't assume that. But let's say that most of you here have come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Great, then you're saved. You have the hope of resurrection put before you as a certainty based upon the scriptures. And when I say the scriptures, I'm not just talking about Paul's scriptures. I'm talking about the whole mass and body of the Bible. Right? On that authority, you can know life eternal. Question is, where are you going to spend that life eternal? Good question. Well, what you're going to have to do, my friends, is believe the gospel, as Paul gives it in Ephesians 3, the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. So that's why I say, I believe but. I believe but. I believe but. I'm going to pull back here. Sorry. Yes, I mentioned it here also. And I'm mentioning it here. Look at this. There are responses to this. I mean, you might say, well, I don't understand. This, this is all, this is, I, I don't understand it. It's too complicated for me now. I believe the gospel that Jesus died for my sins, but I, I don't really know whether I believe this other stuff, man. It's complicated. And I, I'm not sure that I get it. Okay, so you don't believe it. You see, you can't say, well, I'm not sure, and then say that's going to get you through, right? <laughs> that's not going to get you through. Can you do that about the gospel of your salvation? Do you think the gospel of your salvation works that way? Or, well, you know, I don't really know that I believe that, that Jesus died for my sins or not. No, that's not going to get you saved. Right? So why should it be any different for the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ? Do you get the point I'm making? So if you say, well, I don't know, well then, that's the, that's the same as a disbelief. You don't believe it. So there are three possibilities. I believe, but Paul is just Paul. There's no difference. It's all the same. There's nothing going on. You know, nothing's happening here. Paul is just Paul. And this idea of writing AU is just you in your imagination. There's really no difference. That's one position. Then the other one would be, I believe, but I'm not sure. Okay? And then the other one, the last one, and the one that I hope that you're coming to, I believe, and I believe, man. I believe, and I believe. Man, we ought to make a song about that. Right? I believe, and I believe. 
Man, I could just about hear the words and the music right now. Rock and roll, man. <laughs> I believe and I believe. What a great message that is. Now you might say, well, yeah, that's fine for you, but I'm still not quite sure what's going on. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's like me uh, many years ago, too. That's like me. We're, we're not here about trying to get your arm and push it up the back and say, hey, repeat after me. You know, that's ridiculous. All that's required is that you have an open mind, an open heart to the things of God and see whether you follow this through. So there are different callings in the Bible. And some people are going to live on the earth. Some people are going to live in the New Jerusalem. And some people are going to the heaven of heavens. The heaven of heavens. One thing Paul does tell us though, ultimately, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So, there is certainly coming a time when all of these different callings are going to be gathered together out in the future, way in the distant future. But for the moment, we can discern different callings, places where there are different hopes. And so I've shown you about the gospel of your salvation. And so the question that's been asked here, is membership of the body coextensive with salvation? Well, the answer to that is no, it's not. It's not coextensive. It doesn't mean that you believe in the gospel of your salvation that automatically means that you have a hope in the heavenly places. No, you have to believe something else. And there is a gospel there that's being preached. And we need to respond to it. And I go through this in some detail and point stuff out. But notice in Ephesians 3.5, I want you to look at these words. Ephesians 3.5, um, uh, let's have a look at these, um, uh, I should say verse 6, it says 5 but it actually is wrong. Look at verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, fellow heirs. Now if you look at the construction and also these other verses where this particular word is used, you can see what fallow means. It means being joint heir. And all these words, notice, I'll just point it out with the mouse, notice su, su, and su. Su is short for sun, which is a preposition, with. Notice they all appear with the same preposition. Joint heirs. Joint body joint partakers. Something very distinctive has been made. And indeed, look what's right in the middle. Susoma, a joint body. Do you realize that this word appears nowhere else in all ancient literature that has been found, except in the Bible, right here. Right here. That's the only place. That's how distinctive the body which was created at the end of the book of Acts is the Susoma, freshly created. Paul apparently had to invent or coin a new word to describe it. The joint body. Very different. Well, are you interested in this? Are you interested as a Christian? And if you're not a Christian, would you like to be? <laughs> Do, would you like to know life everlasting and then finally to be brought unto perfection and even know the place where you're headed? Now, there are some other questions that might come to you. Uh, it might be that you say, well, what's going to happen to people who die as Christians but do not believe in the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ? That's a good question, isn't it? That's a very good question. Well, one thing we do know is they have life. So they'll have a resurrection. The question is, where will God place them? Where will God put them? Okay, where will God place those people? Now, have you noticed that there, the Gospels go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and that the Gospel of John is very distinctive? Those of you who read your Bibles 
will realize that the Gospel of John is extremely different in its nature to the other Gospels. And if you go back to John, have a look at John chapter 1 with me. John, the first chapter. How are we doing for time? Am I burning the time up here? John chapter number 1, anyone starting to sleep? No? Okay. John number, chapter number 1 and verse 11. It says this, He, that's Jesus, came unto his own. He came unto his own. Now look. Here's the verb. He came unto the things, the private things. So he came unto his own things. And his own people, his own people received him not. He came unto his own things, but his own people did not receive him. Well, that's pretty wild, don't you think? That's a pretty wild way of beginning a gospel. That's not the way Matthew, Mark and Luke start. John starts with the idea that Israel rejected their Messiah. Whoa, whoa, man, that's very different. You have to say, it's a very different way of beginning a gospel. Now, going across to John chapter number 10, have a look at this, John chapter 10, and verse 16. So we know Acts 28, Acts 28, that Israel rejected the Messiah. John begins that way. And in John 10, 16, it says this, And other sheep, and other sheep, I have which are not of this fold, our lace. Them also I must bring, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. There's going to be one flock. So John, he gives you this beginning that Israel said no, and now we've got this interesting picture how that there are other sheep that must be brought in. Hmm, that's interesting. John ten sixteen it says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I must also bring. Notice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. There's others out there. There's others out there to be brought in. Post Acts 28. This has nothing to do with the revelation of the mystery. This has to do with simply believing in the shepherd and the fact that he gave his life for the sheep. Where does Christianity at large basically want to live? John. John's gospel is where a lot of professing Christianity would want to live. Here is the alley, the, the fold. It's an unroofed courtyard. Here are places where you'll find that mentioned. It's mostly translated as palace, but it only comes up as a sheepfold here in John 10. There is the shepherd, the shepherd. Just have a look at this passage. Um, have a look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews and chapter 13. <clears throat> Hebrews 13 and verse 20 says this. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. This idea of God as God of being a shepherd is put in Jeremiah 31 in the very context of the new covenant. And here we have the new covenant mentioned again. Yes, there are other sheep. And they come in all sorts of flavors. Do you know how to tell the difference between a goat and a sheep? If you just looked out on a field and you saw these animals, how would you tell the difference between a goat and a sheep? Well, I just found this out myself because I didn't realize. But a, a goat has a tail that goes up and a sheep has a tail that goes down. That's just a bit of information for you. But here we have other sheep. 
Jeremiah 31.10 Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Now look at this. Let's take this one step further. Okay, so there is a ministry post Acts 28 which John talks about and it relates to a ministry of other sheep that must be brought in and formed with one flock. Matthew 22, 8, look at this. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Oh, the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Guests. Guests to the marriage. What is this based upon? Look. But they which were bidden, that's Israel, were not worthy. Acts 28, context. And now what happens? Go ye therefore into the highways and the byways. That's where you're going to find these people on the side of the road, you know, with, with little brown bags with bottles in. <laughs> yeah. Both good and bad. And bid them as guests to the marriage. You find that written in Revelation, the marriage supper of the Lamb. All related to Israel. Now I think there's pretty good evidence then that we can answer the question, what happens to people who believe on Jesus Christ but go no further? They are people who have been placed into the new fold and flock and they have been subsumed into the promises of Israel they it's very natural don't you think so over here is the book of Acts the hope is here okay so as they go through into the new time zone into the new uh, era some believe and some do not okay some that do not believe they stay with the hope that they had and those that believe of course they are moved into the new hope and it's a very natural thing to see well, what's wrong with staying on earth? Nothing. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful hope. What's wrong with going to the New Jerusalem as an overcomer? And that's great hope. But my friends, if a spirit of wisdom and revelation has been given to you by God the Father, then guess what's going to happen? You will believe and you will believe. And there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do to somehow force you into believing something. I completely accept your decision and congratulations that you're saved. Congratulations for your calling. But if you would like this calling, if God has given you the Spirit, what am I talking about? What am I talking about this Spirit? I'll show you right now. Find Ephesians 1 with me, please. Ephesians Chapter number 1. This gives you so much liberty. Ephesians 1, verse number 16. Oh, we'll read from verse 15. Whereof I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here comes one of Paul's prayers. Don't jump, Dave. <laughs> and it says this, verse 17. That... The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That's what we pray, right? We pray that that will be given to you. And your will will either say yes to God or no to God. You've been shown the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Untraceable, man. Just freshly revealed to Paul. You either receive it or you will not. One thing we will always rejoice in is you have life. Here, I give you a concordance of in heavenly places. It's in the dative case. That's the locative case. That's the location of where your hope is. Ephesians 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, man. In heavenly places. 
Not in the New Jerusalem, as beautiful as it is. Not on the earth, as beautiful as it will be made. But in heavenly places. Is this given to you coextensive with the gospel? That is, you just believe the gospel and this is yours? No, it's not yours. You have to believe the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. You say, how do you do that? Well, how did you, how did you believe on Jesus Christ with the gospel of your salvation? Because it's exactly parallel. Right? This is my message to you. I have given my message. I have delivered it. It is now in your lap. And it's between you and God. Now, I've come to understand these things. They have given me great liberty in the pulpit and have given me great liberty in explaining things to other Christians. This does explain a lot of what you see in the world today. Because what do you see in the world today? Well, you see a lot of Christians who will be proclaiming 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and this great resurrection that's there at the Lord's coming. They will be proclaiming water baptism. They will be proclaiming the Lord's Supper. They will be trying to reinvent the gifts. They will be trying to resurrect all these things. Why is that? Because they have not come to believe in the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Cool? Cool, man. Cool. That's my message to you. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee. For this time we've had together, for all that we've received and understood. Those here, Lord, that do not as yet know Thee as Saviour, Lord, we pray Your Spirit would work in their life. That they would see the, the need for this and come to know everlasting life. And then, after that, that they would go on unto perfection and, Lord, receive the great calling which is theirs and proclaim.